The following podcast contains adult language and themes. Put the kiddos to bed. Pour yourself a drink, because we're going there. Taboo Topics are back on the table. Welcome back. I'm Joe. I'm Matt. And I'm LeJohn. And this is the Going There Podcast. We are going to talk about the unfortunate 2020 election. And I say unfortunate not because of any results or polls, but because of what we've seen America do to itself in the process. We have with us Mike Mad Dog Madgar. I am the only person. I'm one of like six people who calls him Mad Dog. Mike, why don't you uh, say hi? Hello. Uh, how's it going? <laughs> <laughs> Mike, Thanks for having me. Oh, listeners are tuning in and they're writing in and they're saying they're fine. <laughs> so uh, Mike and I have been colleagues for, believe it or not, going on like eight years. Yeah. And Mike is a first time voter, but it's not because he just turned 18. It's because Mike has always been apolitical. Mike, a year ago, yeah. when I would ask you, what do you think about what's going on in politics? What was your answer? It probably just laugh like most of the time. I don't know. Like I, I never really took it very seriously because it, it didn't affect my day to day. But so many of the things that have transpired over the last year have directly been the result of politics and poor leadership. So they've certainly affected my day to day. What's funny is if you see Mike who looks like, uh, you know, maybe like a young Howard Stern. He's got the long <laughs> hair. And most people think he's like a stoner or a hippie. But he's actually like probably one of the most more conservative, very grounded for what people would assume. And, and I'm not saying that as good or bad. That's just what he is. Correct. Yeah. Tell us a little bit about your background. Uh, I grew up in Warren, Ohio. And um, kind of where I grew up, it was mostly suburbia and then what loomed outside of suburbia was the crack addled downtown the the place that was abandoned from yesteryear where all the jobs dried up and all the old people were sort of left to die and the people that were young that were living there were just sort of robbing from them or being evil and we lived in our like small sort of place outside of there that isn't really much better but everybody thinks that their shit doesn't stink kind of thing so when you grow up sort of with very, I wouldn't even necessarily say conservative or religious values, but just, I think that certain people think the ways that they do because they don't grow up around enough people or, or enough sort of like unique situations. I feel like people in city uh, living are, are afforded those sort of luxuries from a young age, but people that grow up in suburbia and especially people that grow up in small towns are often very sort of narrow-minded in the way that they they kind of look at things and they experience things. And if, if people stay in those spots their whole lives, um, they're sort of subjected to become more jaded. Uh, I was lucky enough to sort of leave leave that behind me, but there, there are people that, that sort of aren't. And I feel like those are some of the people that are experiencing a lot of issues right now. Uh, they're having a hard time developing and carrying on. And it's it's really scary. What you said, I think you hit the nail on the head with so much of what happens is not being exposed to people who are different from you and they become the boogeyman. People who are like this, whatever that this is, it's like, they're scary. That's scary. And you meet somebody and you're like, well, this guy's cool, but the rest of them are nuts and they're, they're trying to kill us. They're trying to rape our women and steal our gold and, you know. Eat, eat our babies. <laughs> and our lucky charms. Yeah. <laughs> this is a marshmallow. This ain't gold. <laughs> this is a marshmallow. Who the fuck told you that marshmallows ain't gold? This shit <laughs> melts in water. By the way, they sell <laughs> just bags of the marshmallows from Lucky Charms. Which is a terrible idea. What crackhead is sitting at home just like baked out there? But then again, but then again, when they did Oops All Berries with Captain Crunch. Oh, oh no shit. Yeah. A that's how that's a happy accident. <laughs> a yeah, that, that made more that made more sense. Right. So. Yeah, they're like, please do crack. <laughs> please. So 2020 is the year that everyone became a political genius, right? Everybody thinks they have politics nailed. Well, I, know. <laughs> I, I mean, 
uh, I think some people have found it as a way to educate themselves about the process, which is important. And other people have just bought into a certain way of thinking. They have drank the Kool-Aid, so to speak. I, I'll tell you, before 2016, I did not know that much about politics. I voted, but usually as a, well, let's flip a coin and see who, who's going to make it. You know, I, I voted McCain. I love John McCain. It wasn't anything against Obama. If you read the stories about- John McCain's a centrist. He was a good guy. It was only until he was really trying to win the election that he kind of started to go a little crazy. And he's a politician. You can't go all the way up the ladder in politics without having done something nasty. Sure. Uh, When Obama ran for a second term, I voted Obama. I am not a Republican or Democrat. I will never claim either party because they are both messed up, in my opinion. But ever since 2016, I felt like I'm way involved. And this year, more than ever, I understand the entire process. I read the polls every day and and I just become so concerned. And it's built this wall between me and so many people who don't think the way I do, not because I want them to treat me this way or will treat them that way, but I just can't wrap my head around certain things. How have you guys dealt with 2020 politics and this election, this, I mean, momentous election. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) That's the best way to do (laughs) it. Yeah. Oh, man. I mean, it's been stressful as a woman, as someone who's in the margins. um, (laughs) You know, I'm on the LGBTQ spectrum. I'm a part brown i don't make a ton of money (laughs) no i mean my father was lebanese so i'm half lebanese and that's if you don't know that that's not that's not what a gay woman is that's an arab (laughs) listen as somebody whose um livelihood depends on the the (laughs) kindness of your politics it's been stressful um a lot of my um freedoms and liberties have been questioned or challenged in the past four years so yeah it's been it's been tough it's been stressful yeah yeah i fully agree as a black man this process has been beyond stressful it's been beyond nerve-wracking it's just been you know what honestly for me personally i don't give a damn but i have to give a damn for my children and their children and so on so on so on but i want to make sure you clarify okay when you say i don't give a damn You don't give a damn about the outcome of the election at all because you're disenfranchised. Yes, I am. Rightfully so. Yeah. I wanted to clarify that. Yeah, no, no. And you're 1000% correct. Disenfranchised, you you better believe it. Red, blue, purple, green, it doesn't matter to me. And I make myself care for those who matter beyond me, well after me, and also those who came before me to fight to care. Um, cause I definitely would not dis- disrespect my ancestors who, who bust their ass to even have a voice in this country. Again, to the question, to the point, my God, it's, it's, it's been tough. The day that the Breonna Taylor case came to a close and nobody was charged with her death. You told me what it was like. Yeah, we know because that's just been what it's always been. It's, 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 it was expected. We, there was no surprise. It was, well, yeah, what else did we expect? This is what we already knew was going to happen. And again, I don't know. You and I don't know every little inside and out of the case, but it's it's become this pileup. And to say that you don't care about the outcome, as much as I want to challenge you and be like, pull up your bootstraps and care, you can't help how you feel. And at least you're trying to care, but you can't help that you don't because history has taught you it really doesn't matter in the end, man. Boy, it doesn't matter. LeJohn mentioned um, caring about his children and caring about his children's future. I I think that there's an entire generation of people that are slightly uh, removed from ours that are in the sort of one percentile that don't care about children and don't care about the future because their time to sort of end is, is upon us. And they're all clinging to this idea of whatever the American dream was when they were able to retire in their late fifties and early sixties and sort of say, fuck all to the rest of the world. I wonder when these people became alien and stopped caring about everyone else. Well, I don't think anybody on their deathbed 
says, I regret that I didn't make more money. I, I think, unfortunately, these people find out when it's way too late that there are more important things. It's like the Scrooge thing, though. Yeah. Like, damned if you do, damned if you don't. Like, what? Like they should have just been sort of thinking those things all along. They did I, nothing to sort of correct those measures during their lives. And I think that this has exposed a lot of really negative people and a lot of really negative things that they do to others on the regular. It's so sad and, I, dare I say, immoral that you have these one percenters, or let's say even two percenters, who are getting the people who are low income who do not have access to the same things to support those people. And their whole goal is to make more money and to have more control over the people. That's my issue with people who vote against their own interests because they're often single party. Edit this if it's inappropriate. You're not going to hurt anyone's feelings here. (laughs) No, it seems like a lot of like single issue voters are uneducated people who want to feel like they're better than the minority. Let's say you want to vote if if you're against abortion. I've been seeing a lot of signs in my neighborhood, vote pro-life and Trump. What happened to just like thinking about it? Because if you actually are against abortion, wouldn't you want to know that the candidate that you're voting for might not be? And as part of his treatment, wasn't like their stem cells being used in order to help him recover. I mean, that's a direct result of dead babies and abortion and things of that nature. We're definitely going to do a deeper dive on abortion, probably more than once on this show. I really hope to. But the thing that I've tried to talk to people about during this election specifically is, first of all, if you're pro-life because it's about compassion, I get that. But that's usually coupled with, I don't care that there are kids in cages. I don't care that people's civil liberties are being destroyed every day. At what point when I stop being a fetus and start being a human, do you stop caring? And if you don't stop caring, can I get an education, please? And can I get paid good? Are you talking to me? No, 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 no. I only gave a shit about you oh, when you were inside. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Now that you're out here. Yeah. The fuck out of my face. Yeah. So just like when, where is that like demarcation line? And, and asking that not in like an antagonistic way, but just in like a logical way. Here, here, the only way, okay. I won't even get into it because I feel like that's a whole other episode. Yeah. So yes, there are single issue voters. And, and again, I get it. I understand Somebody who can look at that, who believes that they're voting that way because they care about babies. Uh, uh, we can all get on board with that. It's it's when they don't start questioning the other things. That's the part that's weird. That's the part that's like a red flag where it's like, OK, maybe you actually don't care about that single issue. What is it do you care that you care about? Do you care about me challenging you and that's offensive? Or do you care about an underlying issue of like, well, my family has always voted this way and I'm comfortable this way? Maybe we should just unpack that. Uh, I'll be the first to say, I think that's tough to question the ideals that you've been raised on, that you've always held true. To question your existence is suddenly to like see the matrix, right? That's scary. Yeah, it's Most it's people, work. Yeah, it's work. And it comes it comes at different levels, too, because um, there are things that we were taught by our parents and everything that we hold so true to. And it's like, well. That's what I was taught, and I'm going to stick to that. And And if you questioned it, mm -hmm. you're suddenly questioning whether or not you love mom and dad, or or are they good people? Right, right. And that's the, which again, you said said it's the scary part, you know? I question those who don't question. Because as I tell my children all the time, I'm going to tell you as best I possibly can what I know for a fact and what I've experienced. Everything outside of that, I could damn sure be incorrect about. I could be wrong. I love it when my children question my logic and my approach and everything like that, especially when I know for a fact I have an answer to it. Except for when you're like, eat the damn food. Yes, because <laughs> I ain't buying shit outside the top. My mother believed that she could, we could have seven boxes of cereal, okay? But we were only allowed to eat one at a time. We were not allowed to have more than one box of cereal open at a time. First in, first out. I said, this is bullshit. I said that when I was young, okay? I question this. Exactly, yes. So as an adult, when my children, when I have 11 boxes of cereal, and they said, Father, that's what they say. They say, Father, may I please have some some, some Captain Crunch? May I please have some Apple Jacks? I said, you know what, son, daughter, you can have whatever you want. 
You can have the Honey Nut Cheerios. You can have the Apple Jacks. You can have the Cookie Crisp. You can have Lucky Charms. You can have the Fruit Loops. Whatever you want, you can have them. Wanna know why? Because in this house, damn it, it doesn't matter if one box is open. Multiple boxes at a time will work in this house. I don't believe in the shit that your grandmother told me about boxes of cereal. Now, that's a very minor level. Can you imagine the things on the major level? Okay, cereal is one thing. That's it's really it's funny. You know, it's fun. No, it's yeah. it's everything. <laughs> a lot of people are single issue cereal voters. <laughs> Can you imagine if saying, you know what, man? I know mom and dad was real tough on this thing on abortion, real tough on sex before marriage, real tough on <laughs> drugs. But I just I ain't feeling it. And this time that we're going through has made us question people that we care about a lot. Like, wow, you you really think that way? I was in the same house with you when you were thinking that shit. Listen, the tricks rabbit was in the KKK, but I don't care because he was anti-abortion. <laughs> right. He was for kids. <laughs> Do you think that those people held those thoughts their whole lives or that they grew into them? Like, have they maintained that same sort of mindset? That's a great point, because I don't know. It seems as if they, they were just that that mindset was beat into them all this time. And that's all they know. When you're raised in certain households, especially with strict parents, your whole thing is honor and respect and listen to your parents. And so anybody of any walk of life, any religion, any political view, they think to question those teachings, to question the way you were raised is a bad thing. So in their in their view, in a bubble, they're doing what's right. So I'm not saying it's right, but... Can you understand? I mean, where do we draw that line is I get where you're coming from, but I understand. Uh, You also want to like you want to honor and respect your parents. But a form of honor and respect is also to recognize that they're humans with errors and uh, maybe that they are products of their time and place, whatever cross section of like geography and history. And that maybe there are also possibilities. There are possibilities outside of this like myopic world that your tradition is telling you. LeJohn's talking about his mom and the cereal box thing. My mother was raised by essentially a single parent for some of her life. So she was raised pretty poor. We probably were more poor than we realized growing up. I think part of it was because she was so thrifty, but it was it's it's funny. She raised us like we were living during the depression. <laughs> it was like, <laughs> it was when the generic stuff was, there was no color on the boxes. It, it looked like, it looked like government subsidized. Like she got it from East Germany. <laughs> <laughs> we didn't have Lucky Charms. We had like stars that you might not like that much. Just eat it. <laughs> and so in, in some good ways, I have, I still have that quality of me where I questioned when something costs too much. And I have to naturally fight it. If I need new shoes, I don't automatically go, I'm going to buy new shoes. I think, well, did I really get enough wear of the old ones? Could I still grow into them? <laughs> let's, uh, before we go to a short little musical break, let's, let's end on a high note. So one of the things that Mike has been really cool about doing is making sure that he and his band continue to make music and to perform while they can't do live shows. And so uh, you're hearing the music today of King Boo. Well, yeah, so the, the King Boo is is a Mario uh, antagonist, uh, notable for his role in Luigi's Mansion. <laughs> but uh, Majin Boo uh, was an antagonist in one of the sagas uh, toward the end of Dragon Ball Z. And uh, I like his color scheme, pink and purple. So we kind of uh, adopted those colors, yeah. We sort of jammed a little bit when we were in college, but uh, when we all sort of moved to Cleveland, that's when we decided to to really start pursuing uh, music together just as a creative outlet. I mean, we all have sort of careers in other professional fields, and um, music was kind of a way for us to stay connected and to be able to sort of make art with your friends uh, has been an incredibly liberating experience, especially through hard times that I've had and things of that nature. Cleveland has a wonderful sort of artistic scene as well as Akron and other surrounding areas. So it's been it's been really cool to be a part of that, play some really excellent shows and sort of be able to, to share your art with, with other people um, and, and to do it with your buddies. It's always been my dream, I guess, to do one of these sort of like uh, holiday specials a la like Paul Lynn's like 1960s Halloween like laugh and kind of this absurdist like take on the the Halloween specials of yesteryear so we took our highfalutin 
bizarre rockabilly music and applied it to bad B-movies, cult cinema. Um, we, we constructed two sets. Uh, we had um, a very limited crew of which Tyler Kubisti, my coworker and friend, was a part of. Cameron's fiance, Rachel McGrail, and I, I think that without having the, the sort of support of our partners and um, each other as friends, uh, we wouldn't have been able to accomplish what we accomplished and have, have that sort of energy translated to a show that maybe if people hadn't seen us or even if they had, it, it, it might be able to give them a smile or a good time around Halloween, maybe make them feel a little bit more normal. Uh, if you're ever looking to do videos or collaborate uh, in a video sort of sense, like definitely King Boo is your friend. Let us know. We're happy to help. This week's Snack Sips and Sweets is Missing Mountain Brewing Company in Cuyahoga Falls, Ohio, outside of Akron. They pride themselves in using natural ingredients to make a very hoppy, just good beer. You know, um, and this stuff is really delicious, man. I'm, I'm checking out the, uh, the Prince juice. I was so happy when they still had it because it used to be seasonal. God, it's it's like the best thing. Prince Juice. She wore a raspberry beret. How would you say that? She wore a raspberry beret. I think you changed the terms so we don't get sued. She wore a cranberry fedora. So what kind of beer is Prince Juice? Listen, this beer is so delicious. It's fruity. It's it has raspberry puree and vanilla beans. Think a raspberry smoothie. It's not too sweet. It's not too tart. It's somewhere in the middle. And listen, it's going to get you lit. Perfect. Enjoy. And what's the other one that we're uh, tasting here? Mm, this is High Tuck Gym Shorts. This West Coast IPA is brilliantly clear and showcasing aroma and flavors of citrus, fruits, and pine. Now, wait, wait, wait a minute. I've heard all this stuff, but I have yet to crack open my High Tuck Gym Shorts. So give me a second here and just let me... Uh... <sighs> we're going to sell that sound effect. <laughs> <sighs> oh, boy. Joe, it's, good. it's everything you said it yeah, was. Yeah, I'm pulling my shorts up. Hi tonight. You watch those old movies of, of the basketball players, and they they have their uh, shorts pulled up to about the nipple line. I, I'm thinking like Richie Cunningham playing basketball, doing a uh, a granny shot for the free throw. Like th that's kind of the the era I think they're going for, and it's perfect. Love it. Let's unfortunately talk a little bit more about the election. LeJohn, Le I want to ask you specifically, what have you experienced during this uh, election season with, especially the Black Lives Matter movement was a huge part of this year. This, um, and thank you for the question. This, this moment, this movement isn't for black people. It's for everybody else. We've been living it. We've been living this for a long time. We've been seeing it on a daily basis for a long time. What we're trying to tell you as far as what matters and everything is, is what we've been trying to display and, and have be recognized for such a long time. Um, like they always say, Black History Month, it's not for black people. It's for everybody else. <laughs> it's for everybody else to recognize the contributions, the, the efforts, the struggle and, and, and the purpose that this race of people has brought towards this country and beyond into the, into the world. LeJohn is the guy who you'd sit there, have a beer with, talk with. They'd think, see, he's not pissed off about this whole thing because they don't really want to know the answer. They'll speak for them happily and say, they don't see there's a problem. Like, I treat everybody the same way. Yet, have you ever asked them? If there was a problem, have you ever as as a white person or as anybody else beside the person of color, have you ever looked at them in the face and said, you know, what do you think? How do you feel? Instead of just assuming that, you know, oh, I got black friends and everything and they never talk about that shit. Everything's fine. Everything's great in our universe. I bet it is when you don't have those hard conversations, when you don't ask those hard questions. I'm certain it is. Listen, make no mistake about it. Of course, 
we all matter. But the reason that we're saying Black Lives Matter is because there's been so much negativity towards the black life that we want to point out that, yes, wait a minute, step back, recognize the fact that we're here and we have purpose. People defending Trump's not racist, but it's white people saying it. I mean, at least 95 percent of the time. Trump's not racist. Well, why? Well, he said so. (laughs) But he also said the Central Park Five should go to prison, even though they were innocent. (laughs) And they did. It's not even so much that anymore as it is people spreading misinformation among one another, getting caught in echo chambers and sort of imploding. So as we sit here right now, we're two days after the election and we still don't have a result. I already feel very strongly for facts and let's just say some feelings of how it's going to turn out. What I'm worried about is what happens afterwards. The posts I've seen on Facebook, I have challenged myself not to defriend and unfollow people. So I see some things and what people are willing to believe is, as we've talked about, it's scary. I mean, there's so many things about, I heard that actually there was only 157,000 people registered and 300,000 people in this county voted. It's obviously rigged. Why do you believe this? Well, you mean, you look at like the stoned out college dude on his couch being like, they're going to tax me into oblivion. And it's like, (laughs) dude, like. Ne- this never applied to you at any point. You're like, frat boy libertarian. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> an like, interesting cross section. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. and, and that's just one example of misinformation that was dramatically spread. And and it, this whole year, it just feels like it's gotten more and more intense. And I think a lot of the the troubles that we experienced during the pandemic were because it it was an election year. Masks were politicized. Science was politicized. The basic understanding of healthcare was politicized. We should be hailing the doctors and nurses and all these people in that field as heroes, and instead we're combating them. And what was really scary is when people started showing up at the polling locations and turning the polling stations into the enemy as well, based on not just misinformation, but somebody's emotional knee-jerk reaction. And the people who worked at these stations were volunteers from the community of all parties and who were just trying to do their jobs. This whole idea of, this is America. Yeah. And the one thing that makes us free, this freedom we're always talking about, this democracy, is voting. I don't care how you vote. I celebrate the fact that you did vote. Yeah, I vote with my pants on one leg at a time. <laughs> okay, so let's talk about voting for a second. Le John, the first time you and I met in person, we sat down. Um, when we met and we sat down and we talked about it, I say, look, man, I only voted twice, and you can pretty much guess when those two times were. And it was for Barack Obama. It was for the brother. Naturally, being a black man, you know, it, it was very important to me. Uh, 2020, and here we are now, I voiced my opinion. I put my vote out there. And... um. Who I voted for, it's not important. It's none of your damn business. But I did. Howie it. Hawkins. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. It was a right in. <laughs> Kermit thy frog. Yeah, but <laughs> Fortunately, Kermit the frog lost by one vote. <laughs> Especially as a black man. If Martin Luther King couldn't change this world, what the fuck can I do? I feel that way sometimes, man. If that man couldn't do it, they popped him in the head. You know, for everything that he he tried to do to change this world. So instead, I'm going to try to change my world. And in the process of changing my world, those who are in my within my world that surround me in this world and everything, if I can help them, then they'll help somebody else. And the person that they help helps somebody else and so on, so on, so on. I don't think that's in contrast. No, I think that that's wonderful. And uh, somewhere where I strayed is that instead of doing that, I would villainize the people who have different views than me. And I would say, well, you are the reason that things are going down the shitter. You can only do what you can do, the little amount that you can do. And if it's making the world better for the people that you interact with, that's that's huge. That's a start, right? Yeah. I mean, you got to start somewhere. Everything, every journey is one step. There is the quote that's attributed to Gandhi Be the change you wish to see in the world. It's really just about being the example and doing the good you can do 
what you're saying, I don't think that goes against what Martin Luther King did. I, I think he had a bigger platform. I think, and maybe it's just my opinion, if you were given a bigger platform, you would do good with it. Doing good is not defined as one thing. The problem is, as humans, we see things in black and white, so we think there's an end. The end is utopia. Wait, who's going to mow the yard in utopia? We live in the now. Let's try to make the now as good as we can. And the best thing we can do is to lead by example and to be good people, to be kind. Everybody has the ability to be good and bad. Very few people are all or nothing on either side. I don't know how you can be, honestly. You can't have good without bad. My mother would say, <laughs> it's okay to make mistakes as long as you learn from them. You just can't keep making the same mistakes over and over. We worship these people from the past and say they were perfect. George Washington, you go deep enough in anyone's backstory, they weren't perfect. But you know what? Let's celebrate what they did well. Walt Disney, who I, as a person who's all about creativity and imagination, love that. Then you start finding out about his personal life and you're like, well, he was kind of a piece of shit. The good still outweighed the bad and what he did for kids and what he did for imagination, what he brought to the world was still a good thing. You don't have to take it wholesale. I mean, celebrate what people did well, well right? Now we're getting into the whole cancel culture where it's like you cancel someone for doing something wrong. Right. Well, I don't understand why we need to dwell on the past so much anyway. Like, I, I don't know why people can't focus more energy on just moving forward. Like, it, it seems like people get stuck so much like on the beliefs of those that lived like centuries before them, years before them, or even during their lifetime. In 1993, Joe thing. Biden supported the blah, blah, blah. Right. And it's like in some time in the thousands, Donald Trump went to like Jeffrey Epstein's pedophile island. When people bring up old clips of Donald Trump talking about politics and how he'd be a Republican because people are stupid. We've all said stupid things in the past. I don't. To me, it doesn't matter. He wasn't I, a politician then either. That's my point. We're, we judge people based on so many other things from the past. And if the spotlight were on us, we'd be just as scared. The point is, what is he doing in the now? People doing that take take away the argument that he's doing bad things now. You don't need more proof that he has done and said things that totally go against the conservative mindset. True. Uh, however, we're talking about like, oh, we shouldn't vilify people for things that they've done in the past, but you do need to be held accountable for your actions. The thing what you need to do is you need to be admitting it and then also learning from it. It's so easy in society and history to talk about what's negative. And it's almost like we've been conditioned to just always first think that something is wrong, something is negative. If in this setting here, I left my cell phone on the table and I went to the bathroom and there was more people in this room than us. And when I came back from the bathroom, my cell phone was gone. My mind says, who stole my cell phone? Instead of saying, one of these awesome people put my cell phone away because I wasn't in the presence of my phone. You're welcome. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Also, check Craigslist. <laughs> if LeJohn goes out in public and some guy says to him, hey, man, nice shirt, asshole. He's going to be like, what the hell is this guy's problem? I think I might want to fight him. If he sees me and I say, nice shirt, asshole, he laughs, we chuckle, and we move on. It's all because you come from the standpoint going, I trust Matt. He has good intentions. He cares about me. Our circles have gotten so small that we don't think a lot of people care about us. Because they Sad don't. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to say, because sadly, they've shown that they don't. and. To bring it back full circle about politics, whatever party you support, support it. Find the facts. Just find the facts. Find but the facts. But that's the problem is there's been so much misinformation when it comes to the facts. So people are just buying into the ideas that service their own agendas. I was going to say it's definitely a problem. It's definitely how people who are controlling the narrative are controlling the people who have the right to vote but don't have the information and might not have the uh, resources to vote in the same vein who the people who are creating the narrative. I, at least three of us in this room have a degree that is technically in journalism. Correct. Oh, yeah, technically. Yeah. In journalism, you understand and you learn about. And I even went on to teach media literacy. Some of the people we're talking about don't have the luxury of having that kind of education. 
our parents, for example, were all raised in the society where there were three media, main media channels, and you never had to question whether or not what they were telling you was true. And there was also Woodward and Bernstein, so uh, journalism was romanticized. You know, there was like the moral high ground of journalism, as opposed to now, where we have a 24-hour news cycle and that we need to acquiesce to whatever the advertisers are saying so we can get the ad time. But, you know, you're packaging an advertisement in a little news segment. You're like, it's like when you're giving a dog a pill and you're folding it in some cheese. That's what a lot of our news is. It's a business. The way I deal with it, I don't get my news all from one source or even one side. I will read Fox News as much as I read CNN because I realize the truth is somewhere in the middle. And so that's what we have to do as Americans. But don't you just wish you could just get the truth? Yeah, like, why, why does there have to be this the middle? Like, why, why, are, why are there two sides that are so, like, opposed? Yeah, like, why is it my fucking job to read Al Jazeera, BBC, Fox News, CNN, MSNBC, and then find the middle ground? Like, I'm a fucking matrix? Like, I don't, <laughs> like, I should get paid money to do that. And, and you just hit the theme of our show. <laughs> Being the bigger person is not fun. Being a good person is not easy, but we either take it upon ourselves to be that person or we're one of the ones that we say sucks. When our president makes a statement that essentially says anyone who's not with us is against us, when they say all Democrats, Democrats are trying to do this and they villainize everybody who's not on that same boat with the flags flying high, that's a problem. And I'll tell you why I voted Biden is not because I thought he was the greatest thing since sliced bread. In fact, he's as boring as white sliced bread, but. I love bread. <laughs> he's, he's, he, he's empathetic at the very least. He never made it about Trump supporters, about Republicans. You know what? We can probably get along and find a middle ground. Uh, you know, my belief is the people in this room don't buy into any one mindset. Because I question things that come out of the left as much as I do the other side. People don't look at themselves enough. They're, they're so quick to look at others and they're so quick to judge others, but they, they never really take the time to stop and be like, well, why do I think this way? Like, why, what, what position am I coming from to want to judge somebody the way that I'm judging them? Right. So before we give our final thoughts, our six cents for the week, we also want to thank and give a shout out to our sponsor this week for the Snack Sips and Sweets. Missing Mountain Brewery. Some amazing beer that they have uh, provided for us. We have been sipping on it for these shows, and it is some great stuff. And you can go to missingmountain.com, and we're also going to post it on our pages. We also want to thank Mike Madgar, a.k.a. Mad Dog, and King Boo for being the music, which you're going to hear one little bite after this as well. Our music is available wherever music is available. I would also like to say that all of the opinions that I expressed on this podcast are that of Michael Madgar and not those of King Boo. So remind uh, them one more time how King Boo is spelled. Yes, King Boo is spelled uh, King as in King and Boo, uh, B U U. Uh, you can find us on Instagram at underscore King underscore Boo underscore or Facebook.com slash King Boo music. Yep. <laughs> King Boo is my favorite Chinese restaurant. It's so. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, let's be honest. It's King Boo Garden, okay? <laughs> that, that was yeah. That was that was the initial band. King Boo Mountain. <laughs> King All right. Boo Buffet. <laughs> <laughs> the Boo Buffet is the best. <laughs> King Buffet. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So here's the thing. We mostly agree on what's important. We want our families to be safe. We want healthcare to be affordable. We want our children to be educated. Let's not forget that what makes us similar far outweighs the things that we don't agree on. What makes us Americans is our right to vote, and we've all voted, and we should respect each other's vote regardless of what the outcome is. Let's learn how to coexist because nobody, and I mean nobody other than the 1%, really is going to get any benefit out of us being divided, hating each other, being violent towards each other, or thinking that the other person is the enemy. We want to be fulfilled people, and fulfillment is met through coexisting with our neighbors, with our friends, with our families, with other human beings. Can you imagine 
going through each day without these two simple concepts that I want you to be very grateful for. The two C's is what I call them, a choice and a chance. Can you imagine waking up every day minus those two C's? Think about it for a second. Coming out of your bed, both feet to the floor and saying today I have zero choice and I have zero chance. Well, that's not the case, boys and girls, because every day you wake up, you have a choice and a chance. It's not about what you choose. You choose whatever you want and feel free to choose as such. But man, take advantage of that chance to choose. That's all I got. What are we talking about? (laughs) Cereal boxes? (laughs) Oh yeah, very, very crunch. Yeah. Okay. So, guys, you know, you should love living things. As Lao Tzu would say, knowing others is wisdom. Knowing yourself is enlightenment. So don't be worried to question yourself, to question uh, the things that you've been brought up with. Um, that just makes you a stronger person. I appreciate you guys having me on. I appreciate it. me like plug my art and my music. Um, I'm sure my guys appreciate it too. I think at the end of the day, a lot of people probably, I, I would hope that, that they have somebody to tell them that they love them, that if they don't, like I love you and I hope that like you're able to make your own way and that this doesn't discourage you from your dreams this year. I think it's been really hard on a lot of people and it, it breaks my heart to see people that I respect and admire spiraling in, in different sorts of ways. And I, I, I just, I want everybody to grow and I want everybody to succeed. And I, I hope that when we do come out of this pandemic, they can be the best versions of themselves possible. And, and we can really start rebuilding a society that, that welcomes everybody. So we just went there. Now we want you to go to Instagram at the going there podcast, Facebook at going there podcast, or email us at goingtherepodcast at gmail.com. This podcast is made possible by its hosts and Frame One Media in association with Lindsey Baker, Tyler Kubisti, Michael Madgar, Joe Calley, and Bobby Thomas.